Recording has started. Thank you. Yeah, go for it, Joe. Explain so to, who to we are. Reiterate your, reiterating your question of uh, what level does the Pirate Party serve? So we were established many moons ago as an international party. So we work on the international level. We work on the uh, national level. We work on the state level. And you'll actually find a lot of pirates doing frontline work for the government right in our local towns and municipalities. Um, we're pretty well diverse. Even though we're a small party, uh, we generally punch a lot higher than our weight class because we practice something called we call swarm care or we're using the swarm. I apologize. That's my daughter in the background running around like a crazy little girl. Um, this is what happens when I give her cookies instead of having nap time. Um, so... That being said, um, we when there's a common thing that we know a lot of groups are not going to really like to stand, we reach out to our contacts, the community, and we, we help organize a bunch of groups together in order to in order to have something that I, we know are going to affect a lot of people. So, um, like for example, we work with Rank Choice Voting because we support them. We work with the ACLU. We work with all these different groups in order to make sure that we're really involved in the community. Um, do we want more people to become a pirate? Of course. Um, and eventually that's our long-term goal. But the truth of the matter is we would rather be focused on having really, really solid principles and solid. I'm sorry, Jamie. Could you take over for me? <laughs> oh yeah, sure, no problem. Um, so, uh, I mean, we we do want to be an. I mean, we we try to be an evidence part, evidence based party. So, looking at what the data is, while also recognizing that, um, unfortunately, that data can be manipulated, and we have to be open to that. Um, and, and open to understanding that, whether that's a particular corporation doing their own poll or their own research that could be biased potentially, whether that's uh, a political party doing that, whether that's, you know, the, the gun lobby trying to make sure that there is no research um, on the effects of guns and their effects on people, you know. So... Mm -hmm. You know, we we believe um, we we believe in that that evi in, in evidence based policy. But Sophie, why don't you or V? Why don't you you, you want to say something? You're on mute. All right. Uh, oh, great. Go for it. All right, I just didn't realize the wrong mic was on. Um, yeah, but uh, hi everybody, I'm V, also uh, known as Sarai Sophie Van Soviedo, current um, Texas captain. So I'm here at the Massachusetts party. But Joan, um, Joni, you, you, your question was more specific. Your question was, you know, does the pirate party do things, you know, locally and more is particular to Massachusetts? And the answer is yes. Most of the Massachusetts pirate party members and volunteers work for issues pertaining to the Massachusetts area. Um, I want to highlight my friends, um, and they've mentioned a lot of great things of what we do, you know, national level um, in terms of like swarm wise and swarm care and the swarm system. Um, I used to be the swarm care manager for the National um, Pirate Party of the United States. Um, I've done international delegation with the um, Pirate Parties International, which works very closely with the three UN um, uh, conference areas, one um, stationed in and headquartered in New York. Uh, we have um, a, a, a previous um, national wide um, co uh, chair who, who attends those regularly. So this is, you know, in terms of like um, what Jamie's, uh, not Jamie, what Joe said earlier about how, you know, we're an idea 
ideological based party where we believe in individual privacy and accountability and um, transparency from corporations and our government. Um, I just really wanted to throw that in there because sometimes oh, yeah. my my um, colleagues get carried away with other things, but yes, I just wanted to really directly answer that question. Sorry. Oh, that's no, fantastic. No, I'm just here. Welcome to hear everything. So it's uh, cool. Yeah. Nice to meet you. Yes, great to meet you. I'll, I'll, I'll give the floor back to my... Hi, B. Yeah, so in terms of local activities, uh, we've done a variety of things. You know, we've, we've run candidates for office um, uh, generally at the state representative or lower level. Um, you know, we, we haven't really run anyone for U.S. Congress or state senate. Um, or county, we would be really, it'd be, it would be really nice if we had a candidate run for sheriff. I think I think a pirate sheriff would be quite appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, and then Steve is an office holder. Um, he's a town meeting member in Arlington, where he's affected uh, through his efforts a, a wide variety of change and influence in, in sensible um, housing policy um, mm -hmm. and other stuff. And, you know, this upcoming election, which I'll talk more about at the campaign training in terms of in, in, at 1.30, um, will, you know, it, we're, we're encouraging folks to run this training as part of it. Um, and that's at generally at the, say, state representative or, or town level. Elections for towns are every year and basically the first half of the year it's up to the towns to set their individual dates and then uh, city elections are odd years and of course um, state and federal and county elections are, are even years uh, it's, and we indeed have some coming up now so um, and, and then we've done other stuff. We've, um, we have a project, cctv.masspirates.org, which shows a map of um, most of the cameras in OpenStreetMap, many of the cameras in OpenStreetMap. Um, and so we've had outings uh, where we go out and map those cameras and then update the map, and we can show, okay, we looked at, you know, Fort Point Channel area in uh, the C Seaport District and mapped a lot of Cambridge there, or downtown Boston or Worcester or, or wherever. Um, we've also done crypto parties to teach people how to protect their privacy. Um, and those latter two events, I hope to have more of them coming into this year, especially as the weather gets better. Um, mm. So, and, you know, focusing on for me, focusing on getting people to run, getting people on the ballot, uh, because you have till a state rep has basically until I think it's April 28th uh, to get on the to get the required signatures. And I'll, I'll talk about that in the campaign training. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, once once people are on the ballot, whether they're running to win or just to place or just to get mind share and, and identify supporters, um, you know, that'll happen May, June, July, August, and so on. Uh, mm -hmm. But that will also give us the opportunity to do other stuff. You know, as I said, crypto parties and camera mapping and, and other uh, perhaps more uh, mesh networking. That's something that members have, have helped with that um kind of fell by the wayside uh and hopefully we'll get some new life um you know this upcoming uh this upcoming year yeah so when you were talking about um the crypto party idea it sounds like you serve a, a really worthwhile educational role too for the community 
that sounds like a very educational thing to help people to know things that affect their privacy. And, um, and then you have that activity side um, of exposure of issues and things like that with the cameras. So yeah, just hearing, hearing it all. But then yep. getting on a ballot is also even, even it, it, you know, at local levels and stuff is, is significant. Or just running to have the issues brought forth and to raise awareness, which is also a very important role to play. Yep. And, and you mentioned earlier before we started, you know, the Brave browser, which has a built-in um, uh, ad blocking and is really good about not showing you ads. Um, and it's based on Chromium, so it's, it's similar to Chrome. It uses kind of the same set of software at the, uh, you know, down in the, in the bare bones. But um, it, it doesn't have all the spyware that Chrome has. And it's also yeah. way more efficient. Like Chrome, uh, yeah, Chrome can be a pig when it comes to using memory and other stuff like that. Um, so. Yeah, I'll, uh, just on a side note here, it's probably of interest to, to many people. One of the things that I really increasingly resent and, and really get un severely annoyed with is Chrome, Google taking over. Like the surveillance is so much in our face now. Um, and anytime it seems like that you want to do anything anywhere, you're supposed to sign in as a user, you know? Um, and so I have a, a few different accounts, you know, but it's just really, I, I can't even think of the word to describe it. It, it is so um, in our faces now that they, they just want to be re like surveilling every single website that you go to and et cetera. So, and what you're doing uh, on those websites. And I, I think it's it's off the charts. And the, the, the sad thing is that most Americans are just don't even really know, or they just kind of go along to get along, you know, and then it, it just creeps in <laughs> all of this surveillance. So, and, and they're, they're the, they seem to be the chief, um, the, the chief um, uh, perpetrators of that, of that, you know, wanting to know when you're on YouTube, when wanting, you know, wanting to know a lot of things. It's just sign in everywhere. <laughs> anyway, so I'm happy that you're, that you're committed to this, that issue. Well, that, if I can just chime in real quick, that's one of the big things that we fight. Um, yeah. is fighting back Big Brother in the surveillance state. And we've had some some victories on that, but uh, even up until recently where I was having an issue with my ex and she would come to my property, like, recording me, just accusing me of being... Uh, being Gabriel, I'm on the phone. Thank you. Um, in order to, like in order to like record me against my permission. And there was literally nothing I could do about her coming to my property to record me. And so there's no actionable item in legislation that if somebody, even though in Massachusetts it's illegal, there was nothing the police would do about it. So um, there's no, and that's really one of those things that we have to solve because there's no decency everyone's allowed to record everybody and they but at the same time it's like one of those really fine lines because at what point is free speech and because it's falling under the free speech and i'm a big supporter of free speech if you want to say something or as steve likes to put commit political suicide i want to let you hmm. you know so it's uh it's one of those things where we really have to come to a consensus and come to a conclusion. And do I necessarily have all the answers? No. Um, but I want to try and find them. And then, again, that's why I love this party, because anytime I'm out there and doing something 
her saying something that's not right. Everyone here has no problem saying, Joe, no. Mm-hmm. And I will. So. Yeah, they'll, people will um, speak up if they see uh, things that might not be well or, yeah. It was, and that's good. That's having an open, honest, open and honest relationships, you know. Yeah. Uh, Julian Assange just keeps going through my mind. I'm sick over that, but anyway. Is there any update? I haven't. I haven't heard. I believe in it's coming up in February. His last ditch effort to in in the um, in the UK situation before he would be basically just come to the U.S. to stand trial, which will be a kangaroo court trial, as we know. Um, And I think the threat, just my very superficial kind of judgment on the whole thing, is um, I think right now his everything's being trumped by what's happening in Gaza, the news about the Palestinians that I don't think Julian is getting as much attention as he probably really needs right now. And I don't, I don't know what we can do. Like besides let our reps know that we're very opposed to this. Um, It's, uh, it's so depressing. It's just, it's unbelievable really. Well, so many things in our government are unbelievable. It's so sickening right now. Um, but yeah, um, it, it, it's not looking good for him right now. There are going to be some people over there. Um, Russell Dobular of Due Dissidents. I believe he's going to be there covering it. The, tra- the quote, last hurrah in... England, outside of Belmarsh Prison, or at the court locally there. And um, I think Richard Medhurst will likely be there, too. They're they're alt newscasters, alternative newscasters on, on YouTube in now. Increasingly going over to Rumble because because YouTube demonetizes left and right. They don't like the topic. <laughs> you don't get your money or get demonetized. Yeah, um, I mean another uh, another alternative to YouTube is PeerTube, um, which like um, like Mastodon is federated, so individuals can create their own um, their own kind of YouTube and spin one up, and then that can share content with other, you know, other um, instances, which means that there's no centralized control. Each one can have, so, you know, you, you don't want Nazi content on your instance. Well, then you can ban those folks or, um, you know, you, you want other stuff on, you can choose that. And then people have their choice of, do I go to this peer tube instance or that peer tube instance? Um, instead, you know, Rumble, you know, Rumble can potentially, I think they're, I don't think they're there. I think they're centralized. So they, there may be voices they don't want to hear um, that. Uh, and as a result, they, they exclude those. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. I, I know a lot of the people that I follow, they do half of their show, a part of their show on YouTube. And then they say, now we're switching over to Rumble. So, um, that's kind of how a lot of them are working things now. Hmm. But as word gets out about these other ways, I'm sure this will continue to evolve. Well. Hmm. Yeah, the whole Assange case is, um, you know, shows how much, uh, you know, U.S. law 
doesn't give a if you reveal secrets um it doesn't there there's no public interest exception right mm -hmm. um and the stuff that he that he was that that wiki that me that um wikileaks revealed in terms of the killing in iraq that the government did or in afghanistan you know had a public interest component and that's not a defense unfortunately yeah yeah and what and well who's really trying to bring him down are the hillary people because of the emails that he got from um exposing exposing some of the corruption in the campaigning of the democratic party most of the, um, Democrats. I mean, the Trump administration that went after him for the extradition. So it seems to be a very bipartisan affair. I wouldn't just blame any Hillary folks on that. Oh yeah, but well, they they Obama had stopped it, but then it got res it did get resurrected with Trump. You're right, and and then but the Biden administration has continued it. Um, but I don't think it was a real issue. Well, I could be wrong. I the feeling that I got was when WikiLeaks came out and exposed the war crimes. Um, I think most of the Democratic liberal kind of grouping or whatever was like in favor of it. I believe that was the sentiment at the time. I believe in favor of his his leaking or in favor yeah. of yeah oh, okay. yeah I I believe I believe just from the feeling that I recall back back then the general dialogue was oh thank God we've got Julian Assange you know he's letting us know the war crimes like the quote liberal the liberal left or whatever I don't know these all these all the correct like terminologies, whatever, but um, the MSNBC crowd, I would I would think, um, were in favor of it. I believe the tide of communication did turn when he um, ex exposed the um, Hillary Clinton leaks, the Seth Rich leak, <clears throat> which to me, it seems as if it was from Seth Rich. <laughs> so, like a leak, not a steal. So, I mean, that's just how I've been able to pull it together. But, um, yeah, the, well, the Biden administration continued the Trump policy. So, um, who knows who's, who's uh, controlling who. <laughs> Steve, would you talk about um, what you've been able to do in Arlington? Well, there's, um, you know, I'm a town meeting member, um, and locally, I think housing is probably the one of the bigger issues I've, you know, tried to focus on. Um, you know, and doing a little bit for, you know, improved transportation safety and such in terms of like the surveillance um, I managed to get the town to form a study committee to recommend a, like a, a surveillance policy or a set of policies uh, just in terms of like you know keeping an inventory of cameras and that sort of thing and who has access and um what the foot what footage can be used and not used for um unfortunately it didn't really go any place it's kind of up to the town manager but you know and uh yeah we wrote it i don't think it ever was ever implemented but we tried hmm. so that's in the hands of the town manager right yeah, uh, we just had had one switched. Alex uh, from um, Warrantless.org pings me about uh, you know nudging the town manager. One of these days, I should. <laughs> yeah. Or you know, if there's the people who wrote it could, or something like that. Not you know, one person is good, but many people is better. Mm -hmm. so.
Yeah, I mean, thinking of some of the surveillance, there's a bill in Massachusetts, um, the Location Shield Act, that would prevent data brokers from buying and selling people's location data, um, which would certainly help with some of the surveillance that the FBI or local law enforcement or the NSA uses by, well, we don't, instead of getting a warrant to get this data, we shall instead just buy it on from these data brokers um, and then use that in whatever cases they have. And if there's anything there, then they can go back and get a warrant to get that information. Um, so, you know, if we can, if we can get rid of the data brokers, at least in terms of such data, uh, location data, uh, or a real privacy law, then that would certainly help everybody's privacy because they couldn't go on the, you know, low cost fishing expeditions. Yeah, Joe. That's the one we're working with the ACLU with, correct? And, and, uh, digital fourth. And, and other groups yeah. yeah so they had a good good effort uh, a week of action and that got some media attention and it got some um, interest in the house and the Senate Massachusetts House and Senate but we're not there yet Hence why we want to run candidates so that we can really push a lot of the issues that uh, that we're fighting for right to the forefront. Absolutely. Um, so I, I mentioned this earlier, Steve, when you dropped off, um, uh, my wife, Melanie, has agreed to be quartermaster uh, until we can find uh, someone to more permanently take that position. So that is a relief. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I'll, I'll just pipe in with a little bit of trivia here about my life. Um, Steve, you're in Arlington uh, on the and you're in the, uh, the, the city. Is it the, it's not the city. It's the town council. Oh, the town board, the board. Town meeting. The town meeting board. Um, <clears throat> I don't know whether I should say this or not. Well, I guess it's, it's okay. I, I go back um, to like circa, yeah, 1979, early 80s with uh, one of the town's most infamous people, <laughs> um, Dear Jim Mazzilli. He was a friend of mine, and I used to go out and visit him when he was, he was out at uh, UMass Amherst, and then of course I lost track of him. I did support him as a um, as a state rep, as well as he finally did become a senator, just short lived. Mm -hmm. um, and then after, unfortunately, he was disgraced. I I did hang out with him a bit, um, and and you know became a friend again. But um, it was clear through the time I was with him that. He had some, I, it really is a medical issue with, with mm -hmm, Jim. Mm -hmm. you know, it's a medical issue, and he kind of always was frisky, if you can, if you know what I mean. Um, and it's, it's really kind of sad, because he's a really incredibly intelligent, erudite person, good-hearted, um, you know, on his deep soul level. Um, he works with flowers. He, he he comes from a wonderful, wonderful family. Um, and one side was on jury duty, and his mother was on jury. Well, we, we were waiting to get on jury duty. His family were just his parents were stellar, and his father was a state police guy. Who the saying was going around in our crowd: the one thing you really hated about his job was carrying a gun. He was that kind of a guy. He was just a really good spirited guy. His dad, <clears throat> I think his dad's still living. Um, but yeah, that's my little trivia. I used to hang out with all the intellectuals in Arlington. Um, <laughs> we 
we would do some uh, for certain substances up on Belmont Hill and things like that in the wee hours of the morning with the uh, fireflies dancing around. So I have mm. good good memories of those times from when I was oh, like nice. nine, nineteen. Yeah, yep. So just thought I'd share that little trivia. Mm, well, uh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I have something that I'd like to ask the party at large. Sure. So what are your thoughts and feelings about the sanctions Joe Biden levied against uh, four Israelis for uh, basically just going up against the, like, doing war crimes against the Palestinians? Did you hear about we that? Should, I'll let someone else speak before I do. <laughs> I mean, I think we should always oppose genocide wherever it is and whomever does it, whether it's Russia or Israel or or the junta in Myanmar. So <laughs> wherever. I, I could agree with that. I mean, I, I wish we weren't giving them bombs to rain on, on and shells to rain on innocent civilians in Gaza. Um, I think that's the best thing that we could do would be to rein them in and be like, yeah, we're not participating in this anymore. <clears throat> I absolutely agree with that. I'm extremely, I am extremely opposed to what the U.S. government has done with this. Totally unequivocally 100 percent opposed i'm disgusted uh and this is um this i agree with claire daly i call him butcher biden now i clicked the wrong button sorry <laughs> it happens <laughs> yeah i mean he, I, I, you know I, when trump came in he ramped up the drone strikes. He ramped up the special operations team going in and, and killing people um, in Yemen and other places. And it was nice that when Joe Biden got came in, like the drone strikes dropped dramatically. And the, you know, we, we weren't, as far as I know, we, we weren't sending Tomahawk missiles to like drop cluster bombs on wedding parties or stuff like that. And um, based on the statistics that I saw, um, you know, he was doing better uh, than past administrations, but this is definitely uh, an awful thing he's perpetuating. Yeah, very, really terrible. And and not only that, like it, it actually took, how long has it been? I don't, I haven't followed all of the actions of the International Court of Justice, but it took um, uh, South Africa to come forward and I don't know anyone who said that well anyone that I agree with though um, who has they, they were very much um, praised for putting forth a, a very good case I think one of the reasons this is really at home versus other actions that may happen behind our backs in the Middle East. We we see it on Twitter so much, you know, like every single day it's been on Twitter direct from the source. Um, and listening to Joe Biden's spokespeople, like even after they came out and it was on near unanimous with the council that it is plausible that there is a genocide going on in Israel that um, Joe Biden's spokespeople are, are still saying, oh, well, we think it's meritless. They just very cavalierly dismiss it. And um, 
I think it's only now probably with more pressure from constituents that Joe Biden's rhetoric is uh, supposedly turning more heartful. Uh, I have absolutely, I, I am at my wit's end with this. I, I just can't believe that the U.S. has done this. Can't, it's, it's just, uh, I find it to be horror, horror, horror show. I mean, that's really where the Pirate Party comes in is because we're one of the strongest third parties in terms of being who we are without compromising who we are in order to attract others. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of the people who end up in being strong supporters, long-term supporters of the Pirate Party are people who are just completely fed up with the two-party system. Uh, completely yeah. sick of Democrats, completely sick of Republicans. I've seen yeah. Republicans come to us. I've seen Democrats come to us. I've seen Green Party. I've seen a lot of Libertarians. Uh, mm -hmm. Libertarians probably being one of the closer ones mm -hmm. to who we are. Um, yes, right. But, uh, but with the recent collapse, the Libertarian was going really, really strong. But then with the recent collapse and the takeover of that party by a few radicals in that party, um, a lot of people came over, especially on the national level. We have a lot of, we actually gained a lot of states' support, uh, Kentucky and Pennsylvania and and the like, just because of what happened in the Libertarian Party. So, um, one of the things that I've loved about this party is how true it stayed for so many years, because of our strong moral and ethical background. And um, we don't really compromise on that, you know. So we've always been uh, about being a direct democracy, about being active politically. And we're just going to keep on doing what we do. And, you know, it's slowly dawning on the world that we exist and we're not going away. So, so would, you, would you say that Ron Paul is an example of like uh, more of an old school libertarian that you more admire? Um, uh, uh, a lot of people. Um, Sorry, go ahead. Uh, I I like I like Ron Paul. <laughs> I I've met a few libertarians, not many, but I you know I appreciate I appreciate what happened between the lefties and the libertarians last year when they when they got together and they had the anti-war march. It wasn't very big, but it was uh, a rage against the war machine and. Um, March, <laughs> and it brought together like libertarians with lefties and just all different people from all different political parties, which was pretty cool. And Ron Paul was one of the speakers there. I mean, I've never been necessarily against Ron Paul. He's a third party candidate. So as a third party, I Kinda I think he was always a Republican. I don't. I don't think he's ever not been a Republican. Oh, okay. So he's not, he's not a libertarian. I don't. I mean, he has libertarian with a small L. But as far as I know, he's always been a Republican. I don't think he's. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, he, I know he was an elected Republican. So. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Maybe he's changed since. So. Oh, okay. My mistake. <laughs> Cool. Yeah, I mean, years ago when 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 I ran for office for the Green Party and later Green Rainbow Party, you know, I didn't always agree with libertarians in Massachusetts, but some of the candidates I I talked with felt they they actually they had a set of principles and those principles we may disagree on quite where those principles went, but we're able to talk. And um, I, I, you know, the current Libertarian Party, from what I've been able to ascertain, um, seems very Trumpian. Like we, like the New Hampshire Libertarian Party has been like Massachusetts is a bigger threat than Russia or China, and I'm like. 
Massachusetts, oh. we're like right next door to you dudes. <laughs> you know, really? That that's yeah. what you're gonna go for? <laughs> you know. Yeah. So, yeah. They're, yeah, they're I, I must have met some more enlightened people in the Libertarian Party at that rally because that and I was kind of fishing for that too, to find out what to find out the um the the sway that the Libertarian Party has gone in and what, what I'm hearing is it's gone more Trumpian. So no wonder you're, I would feel the same way. I haven't been keeping up with them, but I did applaud what some of their leadership did do uh, by opening up and helping to organize that action down in Washington, D.C. that brought together all kinds of people from everywhere, uh, from all different parties, really, I think. I don't know if there are any Republicans there. <laughs> well, Ron Paul was there. <laughs> um, but Joe uh, Jorgensen. Joe Jorg Jorgensen. He's a libertarian. Who's that? I, I'm not familiar with him. The name sounds familiar to me, though. It's funny when I've talked to libertarians about different things in the past, and I can't really pigeonhole any one thing now. There's there's a certain flow, and then all of a sudden something seems to go ori, <laughs> and that's just how I I end up uh, uh, end up in a con uh, at the end of a conversation with most libertarians. But anyway. Oh, I see. She's the libertarian candidate for president. Oh, Joe Jorgensen. Joe Jorgensen? Oh, okay. A female. Okay. I think I've heard the name. But yeah, the the um, this whole um, I'm I, I I have honestly cried a lot since this started. So I and I've literally gone into rages that I've never experienced in my life, mm. yelling at the air, calling them all very harsh swear words <laughs> who's doing this? that sounds like a wednesday for me <laughs> like you fucking motherfucker what do you fucking think you're fucking doing to us anyway you know, like oh yeah it's, it's really intense and then I'm oh like, no now we're gonna get a content warning on youtube oh oh, <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Don't worry about it. it's fine <laughs> we don't say we're four children <laughs> so um, oftentimes you you hear in the uh, international uh, type of I guess conferences or pirate conferences you always hear well it's not it's not always smooth seas. We are pirates after all, or something like that. <laughs> hey, I like the hooties. I'm on the hootie side. <laughs> uh, they were, um, the, the, the gossip media was trying to pump up one of the hootie, um, the hootie guys on a ship, and they were calling him a hot hootie pirate. <laughs> uh, he wasn't a pirate at all someone who cares about Palestinian people too. That's why they're blocking the trade of weapons to Israel. Yeah, I'm surprised we don't have a Houthi in the blowfish. <laughs> some say Houthi, some say Houthi. I, it's, it's spelled Houthi, but I, I I'll tell you this whole, this whole um, 
episode in history has really opened me up to a, a greater desire to learn more about the greater Middle East. Um, I feel like I've just been in the dark all along about all of the countries around there, Jordan, Yemen, Egypt, Lebanon, Syria. Um, I, I really, they were just like over there. They were ghostly to me. And that has been a personal gift to me to be aware more about the geography, more about the differences among the different people in, in the Middle East, um, just a, a greater appreciation for that whole part of our Earth. And uh, so I, I think it, I'm, I'm learning slowly about things. From what I understand, um, also, with respect to all this, and I don't know why it happened, but I, I do believe that Joe Biden just did bomb Syria again. Um, there was some Twitter. It last night, right? Uh, just recently, yeah. It was like yesterday or the day before. Yeah, and there was a lot of Twitter um, talk about it. I couldn't keep up with it. Um, yeah, what's really unfortunate, um, and, and I say that, you know, I grew up in Texas, public education. Um, what's really unfortunate about the, uh, the United States and us Americans is that, you know, it's, it's um, I, well, here, I'll say it this way. Mm -hmm. I always show up to international circles, especially um, I have a lot of time. Um, I have a lot of time overlap with the Australian pirates and their meetings. And so I always say, please forgive me. I am an American and I and I have no, you know, concept of geography. Um, and that's my running joke, right? That 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 like clears the air, you know, like icebreakers or whatever. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's so true, though. It's not even me making a joke. It's the reality of the. Um, there are so many countries, and there, and especially in Europe, there are so many. Like right now, we know about Ukraine and Palestine, and I've known about Palestine, not even more than I I should have known. I've only known about Palestine for like the past six years. Um, yeah, and I never knew about Ukraine. And, mm -hmm. and then there are other, you know, Russia has a history of um, conquering these smaller nations after the Soviet Union um, broke apart, dissolved. Um, and it's very unfortunate because I don't know any of that. Right, right. Yeah, I'm, I have to admit, I'm still sorting out the Ukraine-Russia uh, thing because I'm aware that there's a lot of the history of that war that really has been hidden from the U.S. population, like that war has really been going on for quite some time. It's only been recently that the U.S. Pumped, uh, bumped it up. Um, I mean, Russia invaded Crimea in 2014, so. Yes, since 2014. And then there was the backlash of the Donbass that were in the, I guess, the northern part of the Ukraine. Or what, there were like 12,000 people. Western part, yeah. Western part, yeah. Yeah. Which the Ukrainians, so, the Ukrainians have evidence that, well, not just Ukrainians, but there's there's a lot of open source evidence that it was really Russians fighting in the Donbas, and not necessarily indigenous at all. So. Oh wow, wow! I I will admit my bias. I'm attached to the various people that I get reports from, um, which is not CNN and stuff like that. I'm sure neither for you guys, but. I, I am a fan of Aaron Maté and, and Max Blumenthal and uh, people like that who do reporting. So I'm I'm biased in my influence from them. Um, I'm a, I'm like a Jimmy to a lefty. <laughs> so um, so there's still a lot that I don't understand about Ukraine and Russia, but I, I keep an open mind that I could be wrong in my understandings of that. But I'm I'm pretty clear in my I'm I'm a, I feel more clear in my attitude about 
Palestine, Israel, because I did some study. I actually did academic study some years ago on it. <clears throat> um, journal articles, the whole bit, and I read. A big influence was reading Miko Pellet's book, The General Sun, um, and then seeing Miko speak, me actually meeting him in D.C. He grew up Israeli, as an Israeli in Israel and remembers when people were having, Israelis were going into homes and just taking all the furniture out, you know, just, and Miko has a story about how his mother um, said to him, I will never, never do that to any, anyone. I will never be like, like those Israelis, you know, like our fellow citizens. His father was a general too in, um, the Israeli army. So he grew up around a lot of right in the thick of things. I believe his father uh, eventually was against what Israel had done. I, I can't remember 100%, but his book is a very good read and it's an easy read. It's called The General Son, Miko Pellet. He just actually spoke at the European Parliament. Um, and had some very strong words. He's given it a lot of thought. So, and he has rooted. I, you know, it's the irony of it is all my favorite reporters on this subject are all Jewish. Um, uh, Aaron Maté, Max Blumenthal, Miko Pellet, also Norman Finkelstein. I love him. Katie Halper, Jewish woman who's a journalist, um, broadcaster from New York. Um, there's probably a few others too, but those are some of my, the primary people that I, I, I get my information from. So I am biased towards where I get my information from, just in full, um, full disclosure there. And I watch a, a lot of, um, peripheral, peripheral lefty type of broadcasts as well. Mm, sounds like someone's sleeping. <laughs> Joe, is that you? Good morning. I think baby can read his mic. Oh, oh maybe it's the baby sleeping. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> All my stars. Did I fall asleep? Yeah. I appreciate your comments, Sophie, too. Thank you and your insight that way. And how um, we, we just grow up in such a bubble here, you know, that it's hard to know about the rest of the world. <laughs> we really go there. For, for the record, Joe is, I don't know how Joe does everything Joe does. Joe, you deserve that now. Yeah. I am so sorry. No, oh, no. Oh, that was, it was fun. I'm, I'm glad I could log someone to sleep. <laughs> no, but see, it's not, it's because it's not you. It's because Joe is just so overworked. I mean, overstretched, and, and that's just my opinion. Yeah, like my babies kept me up all night last night. Oh. So I do apologize for that. Oh, you don't have to apologize for that at all. Well, it is not an editorial comment whatsoever. I think I think Joe and I take turns going to like the three a.m. international meetings. Well, three a.m. Oh. for me, four a.m. for him. Oh <laughs> wow! Wow. That's probably like 1 or 2 a.m. for you. Well, well, see, because there's, there's two meetings, right? There's the, I think it's the 2 or 3, 2 or 3 a.m. ones, and then there's the 2 or 3 p.m. ones. I think it's like alternates like that. Um, but then I also sometimes present at the... Australian meeting, and I know that's either 3 a.m. or 4 a.m. 
Um, did you know that in most maps, and this I learned from our Australian pirates, in most maps, New Zealand is not even on the map. Oh, wow. That's messed up. Wow. So here's I'm in the building. Sorry, I go thought ahead. I had it muted. But uh, what happened is in order to get quiet, I I had to go up to my room where I ended up laying down, and then I was just done. So. I hope you can get some better rest later today. All right, James, you, we're all quiet now. We're waiting for the next item agenda or we're going to take a break. I'm just kidding. I don't even <laughs> run this one. I'm going to take a, take a few minute break while I get this thing set up. That's fine. All right. I, I think I'm going to have to hop off. I've got I've got a laundry list of things I've got to attend to um, this afternoon. But I wanted to just pop in and say hi and um, just hear, hear what, you, what you all had to say. And... Um, uh, and it, it was great just to chat and stuff, hear about the pirate party. Well, it's nice to meet you, Johnny. Yeah, thanks hey. for thanks for joining us. Yeah, yeah, good, great work, great work. Um, and uh, I may I might see you again. Who knows? <laughs> I'm not sure. We'll see. Hopefully, in the spring at the latest. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, take care. Take hey, care. Thanks. Well. Good luck with everything, too. I'll be on the lookout. I'll be on the lookout. I'm on the email list. Excellent. Yeah. Okay, okay. Bye-bye. Bye. So if folks want to take a, a couple-minute bathroom break, and I'll just get this uh, set up. Okay. Yeah, uh, hopefully I didn't just ruin a, a possible supporter because of sheer exhaustion. I don't think so, but I don't know. I can't. Not at all. Ready when you all are. Well, now I'm well rested. <laughs> We're ready. Those little cat naps. Are you good, V? Oh, thumbs up. There we go. Perfect. All right. So get on the ballot. Um, at our last winter conference, we talked about, and uh, it's in the recording, the presentation that I put together about um, thinking about running for office, uh, and, and other, um, you know, thinking about it, planning it, but also choosing and, and why you should, in fact, um, run for office. So, okay. So this training, this training concentrates specifically on getting on the ballot. I mean, we have videos with other trainings about running for office, uh, so you have the best chance of winning. Um, but as always, life is a remix. You take of it what you want from it and discard anything you don't need or don't have time to use and add things that you learn. So if there's things you learn, tell it, you know, feed it back to us so that we can improve our training. But always learn from your efforts, iterate, iterate, iterate. And uh, ultimately, you have to put yourself out there. You can't win if you don't run. So, um, yeah, okay, good. Uh, so getting on the ballot. So you need to make sure you know all of the requirements and dates to get on the ballot. Uh, if you fail at that, you won't get on the ballot. Um, you need to pick up the nomination papers, gather signatures, file the nomination papers, and of course, um, you know, mail or send thank you letters or notes to everyone who helped gather signatures. 
because you'll need them later and also it's the right thing to do. So requirements um, for federal, state and county offices, the Massachusetts Election Division has a how to run for office page um, at that link below. Uh, by the way, this has been updated to this has been uploaded to masspirates.org. If you go to the 2024 conference page, there'll be a link to it. Uh, it's in a PDF form so people can go and, and read it at their heart's content. Uh, for town offices, simply ask your town clerk. So signature requirements for federal and state. So we as pirates don't run candidates for statewide office. That was a decision we made early on to focus on um, legislative and lower races. Um, some of that comes from my experience in the Greens where uh, what they tended to do was run people for statewide office and usually didn't run people for uh, lower level offices and that creates a, a bad uh, dynamic you know we really need to take a page from our fellow pirate parties in around the world where they don't have a well they have some form of parliamentary system where the, it's important to uh, run people for the legisl legislative, either the state or national offices. Uh, and so that's what we're focusing on. So for U.S. representative, it's 2,000 signatures. For governor's council, it's 1,000 signatures. Uh, by the way, there's nine U.S. representatives and eight governor's council, eight governor's councilors. Um, so something to, to think about. Um, and then for state representative, it's 300 and sorry, state senator is 300 and state for representative is a mere 150. So for county offices, you know, that's sheriff, uh, register of deeds, clerk of courts, uh, different counties have different requirements. So it's a thousand in like, um, you know, Middlesex, which is the biggest county or Bristol, Essex, uh, the Western Mass ones, Barnstable, um, well, Berkshire, Franklin, and Hampshire, uh, not Hampton, which is in the southwest, sort of southwest of Massachusetts, um, is 500, um, Barnstable, if I recall correctly, is down in the Cape, uh, and then Dukes and Nantucket counties, the two islands, are, are mere 25. So, you know, if you wanted to run for any of those, something to think about. Uh, for town offices, Steve is welcome to correct me on this. Select board tends to be about 100. Um, elected town meeting is generally 10. Um, but check with your town clerk. They'll give you the information. Yeah, I, I believe select board might be 50, but um, check with your town clerk. <laughs> city, I know city, like... Mayor is probably in the 150 to 200, depending upon, like Boston is probably higher, uh, Springfield, Worcester, but I know Somerville's in the like 150 to 200, uh, and city council is less, and school committee and so on and so forth. Um, so yeah, I mean, for town offices, uh, you know, there's select board, there's town moderator. Um, I think for some towns, you know, the town treasurer is elected. Um, of course, school committee, all municipalities have a school committee. Um, so dates, federal, state, and county. Um, this year, nomination papers are available mid-February 2014, specifically February 13th. Uh, you must submit your nomination papers for validation by your local election office um, for district and county candidates. Uh, so for state representative, state senator, county offices, uh, governor's council, uh, that would be April 30th of 2024. Now, um, I, I included federal party candidates for 
uh, Democrat, Republican, and Libertarians. Those are the current parties that have ballot status. That would be May 7th, 2024. But seeing as we're pirates and focused on that, that's not our date. And so I put it there as that's parties that have party status have that, but that's not relevant to us. Um, but for federal non-party candidates, so that's pirates, uh, you know, greens, unenrolled, uh, that would be July 30th, 2024, but you know, uh, but that's just federal. <laughs> so that's U.S. House of Representatives. Um, you know, getting on the ballot for uh, state rep, state senate is the same for all parties. It's as if, I don't know, the legislature doesn't want to have competition later on. It doesn't make any sense that they set that date for April 30th. It could easily be July 30th, but, you know, the legislature doesn't want to have competition. All right. So, um, that, so, th so these dates are when you have to submit your nomination papers to your local election office for validation. They then have about a month, um, to go and, um, validate those signatures and hand you back your nomination papers, which you would then go and submit to uh, the Massachusetts Election Division. So district and county candidates is May 28th. Federal non-party candidates is August 27th. And as you can see, April 30th and July 30th. So slightly less than a month. Um, but we'll get into talking about um, how you need to deal with these deadlines. So town dates, check with your town clerk. Every town is different. Uh, they get to see all 300, well, I forget how many cities there are, but all 340 something, no, sorry, 320 uh, something towns have their own dates. Uh, usually in the first half of the elections are some towns having January through June with the vast bulk being in the uh, April timeframe, if I recall correctly, but check with your town clerk. So there are additional other requirements for these offices. Uh, for house, you have to be a resident of Massachusetts on election day, um, which is convenient if you are a pirate with a high, with a, um, difficulty in winning due to a variety of factors, mostly of which money. Um, you know, we, we could easily run candidates for U.S. House who are from other states. Uh, but you must be at least 25 years old. That's in the Constitution. And um, you must have been a U.S. citizen for the last seven years. Um, for Governor's Council, you must have resided in Massachusetts for five years before the election day. For the Le Massachusetts Legislature, so State Senator, you have to reside in the district on election day. Uh, and you must have resided in Massachusetts for five years before election day. For State Representative, you must reside in the district on election day. Um, So county offices, um, you know, register of deeds, you must reside in the district. There's a trend here. Clerk of courts, interestingly, has no residency requirements. Um, county commissioner, if elected, you can't reside in the same city or town as another county commission, uh, another county commissioner. And then sheriff, I'm not sure about the requirements. The state didn't list anything for sheriff. So uh, we'll have to do some research on that. Town offices, hey, here's the theme. Check with your town clerk. So any questions so far? Okay, uh, seeing none. All right, so during the signature gathering period, you must concentrate on gathering the required number of signatures as quickly as possible. So when, when um, I was working on the Nader campaign in 2000, 
um, to gather signatures, or especially when I was running as a green, when the greens had party status. Um, it is important to focus on getting on the ballot. When you've got 10,000 signatures you need to get, or 5,000 signatures you need to get when you're running for some statewide office, it's important to concentrate, especially when you only have, say, a party candidate, which the Greens were at the time in 2002, um, would, um, uh, they would only have about 10 weeks to gather those. So it's important to focus. Um, but, you know, if you're running for state representative, 150 is, is doable. Uh, you know, not saying it's not work, but it is good to concentrate on that. So again, here's the caveat, you know, you can get on the ballot, then you can worry about other activities. Of course, if you're running for U.S. House of Representatives, then you should fundraise too and make sure you concentrate on signature gathering. That said, U.S. House of Representatives for a Pirate Party candidate has um, a considerably longer time than a state rep candidate to get that. They also have to get 2,000 signatures. So, you know, it's a more onerous task. Uh, at least we don't have to do it in 10 weeks. That would be a pain. So where to get them? Uh, where to get your nomination papers? So federal, state, and county office, you can pick them up in person at the election divisions in uh, Boston, Springfield, and Fall River offices uh, beginning February 13th, 2024. Uh, you can also call or email the Elections Division on or after February 13th to have them mailed to you. Papers cannot be provided electronically, and for town offices, ask your town clerk. You need to get the correct papers. Federal, state, and county, and we'll go over what those papers look like. I have some nice screen captures. So, uh, federal, state, and county, the papers should be yellow at least as of last year, as of two years ago in, in, um, uh, <clears throat> in uh, 2022, um, and are only for candidates who are registered in a political designation, not registered in a party or as independents, i.e. what we call Massachusetts unenrolled. If they send you the wrong papers, and it has happened, you need to tell them to send you the correct ones. If you if you say uh, submit the wrong signatures with the wrong papers for your voter status, then you will be disqualified. And I have seen that happen to candidates in the past. It's important to get the right papers, and we'll go over what they look like. Uh, town offices, the papers are white. Uh, being nonpartisan and all. So fill it in correctly. You need to review the nomination paper, make sure you there's some sections that need to be filled in before you get signatures, uh, and you need to make sure they're filled in correctly. Uh, if the form is for a specific municipality, you need to write down the town in the correct field. So here's what a state election paper looks like. I have conveniently marked them in red is what you need to fill out, blue is what the city or town fills out, and orange is sections to read and be aware of. So if we look at this one for uh, the state paper, um, you can see in, there's in the red box, the top is your political designation. If you're running as a pirate, you need to fill that in. If there's no political designation field, then you have the wrong forms. You need to put the name of your candidate or, or yourself if you're running, uh, the, re your res the candidate's residence, the office they're running for, and the district they're running for. Um, so keep those in mind. And then your municipality, uh, you're going to need a s number of these. I think it's three, um, but you can consult uh, that have this voter registration certificate where they certify that the candidate is a registered voter and they have a stamp or write them in, however they do them. Uh, 
that says, yes, we've, we've validated this person is a registered voter in this district uh, and that they haven't been enrolled, a registered voter uh, and has not been enrolled in a political party from March 1st um, through the date of the certificate or as a newly registered voter, which is actually thinking about it something that I missed. You need to make sure that um, you switch, if you're not registered, pirate you need to switch into pirate uh prior to march 1st so february at the latest uh and then when you hand these forms and you'll see the the blue box up at the top it says date and time received by the board of registrars that's for them you don't need to fill that in they'll do that so we flip the page over what looks what's what's there the only thing that you need to worry about there uh, at the top of the page is the candidate. So you need to write your name in there and you should write them in um, before you start gathering signatures. You don't want someone to challenge these because, well, this was the candidate signed their name after after. So people didn't know who the heck they were voting for or who they were nominating and signing for just fill in the form and then at the bottom um, is where two things uh, the red box is where you will write in the city or town and again you should fill that in um, because it's important um, but specifically you can only gather signature you, you can't be in Springfield and have someone sign from Worcester uh, you can have a form that's for Springfield and have someone from Worcester sign it. It needs they need to sign a form that's for their specific city or town, which is a pain for large districts and less so for say state representative. Um, so keep that in mind. You should fill that in. You don't want it challenged. And also, it's helpful to be what which which town which town is this form for again? Oh yes, there it is at the bottom. It is for it is for Somerville or Cambridge or um, you know Pittsfield or something like that. And then the blue box um, is where your registrars will say we have validated the signatures on this name uh, on on this sheet, um, and so that's where they they you need them to do that to say we we've, we've checked it. And here are the number of uh, here are the number of voters uh, that have been filled and, and all that. So, any questions on these forms? All right, let's move on to towns. So, towns a little easier. Um, again, you've got the red box, the red highlighted area. That's instruction for candidates. You need to fill out. Um, and including the deadlines that they have to be in by, um, and the name of the candidate, residence, office, uh, term, whether they're candidate for re-election, political designation, if any, although town elections are nonpartisan, so, um, and then that you as a, as a candidate accept, uh, accept the nomination. And you'll notice there's that, uh, orange box, you know, do not alter this nomination paper in any way um, because additional markings on this paper may disqualify any signatures on this paper. And that I can't stress enough. Don't check things. Don't do stray marks. And we'll get to that later. But it's something to worry about. And then finally, you know, that blue box there is where the Board of Registrars will be like, yeah, we got it on this date. Um, and it's probably just a stamp. <laughs> it's probably set it every day and, you know, just stamp it when they receive it. Uh, on the back is the candidate in the office. So you need to fill that in. That's the back top. And then in the bottom, um, again, the blue section is they will both certify uh, that the candidate is registered in the particular town and um, they'll certify that the, the signatures are valid. 
And then, you know, the, there's optional section committee of five registered voters, uh, where if for some reason you are incapacitated uh, and cannot run for office, these are the people who could sub in for you. Um, something to think of mind, but you don't have to fill it in. Any questions with that? Uh, yes. How often are these papers challenged? Um, it depends on the candidate you're running against. Um, I, you know, my experience has been I've never gotten a challenge, and I've not really seen anyone who who didn't get a challenge. That said, I know past presidential candidates knocked two potential challengers off the ballot uh, by having, or maybe they didn't, but someone who was a supporter, uh, you know, challenged their signatures, and those candidates were. Uh, knocked off the ballot. It is always a possibility if if you and I wouldn't think a pirate would do this, but if um, I could see less scrupulous candidates who don't want anyone challenging them in the general election could potentially do that. Um, but again, I think it's more rare and there are techniques you can, there are actions you can take to minimize that chance. Other questions? Uh, no, but a commentary. So it's better to yes, get please. to make sure that you're impervious and make them waste their time and energy so we could focus on doing proper. Yeah, I mean, if you get more signatures than you need, um, then they're not going to challenge you. So, and that's that's probably the easiest way is just to get more valid signatures. Um, so they look at it and it's like, oh, they needed 150, but they got 250 would be an easy way of like, yeah, you're not going to, you know, there's not enough. Um, you're, you're not going to win that fight. They're not going to win that fight. But all right, we'll go on to that. All right. So who can sign? So any Massachusetts registered voter in your district can sign your nomination papers. Uh, if your district is a town, then only people in that town. If your district is in, you know, two cities and three towns, then only those municipalities. Okay. Not every signature will be valid. You need to plan to get at least 50% more than you need. So if you uh, needed 150, you should go, you should aim for 225. If you needed 300, then you should aim for 450 um, just to make sure that you have enough of a cushion. And, you know, as I said, never make any stray marks on any nomination papers, no checks, no strike throughs, nothing that shouldn't be on the form. You know, I will emphasize this. That is the easiest. If there's like, oh, someone made a check mark on it, that can get it thrown out. And if you had, 20 signatures on there and they were all valid that is 20 signatures you no longer have um so just don't make any don't don't make any uh stray marks on it um so not i, I think i cover this later but one thing i will say is if i have heard of people who when they are signing will like do a slash through the paper you just take that paper and you put it on the bottom. I'll, I'll cover that later. Um, so how many should you plan to gather? So not every signature will be valid. People give you the wrong address. People aren't registered to vote. People sign Mickey Mouse. So again, you need to get 50% more signatures than you need. Uh, and where should you get them? Well, the best way is simply your neighborhood. Door to door is best. Um, you know they're there if you get the uh, if you get the list of voters. You know whether they're voters or not, um, and you can be very efficient about that. Um, you can go to busy if you can go to busy town squares. 
Um, you, the dump and recycling center is good. I mean, I think those are, those are useful if you're running for say, maybe state Senate, governor's council, um, you know, U.S. House of Representatives or like a state representative that is a particular municipality or something like that. So the dump and recycling centers, busy city town squares are good places. Your best is literally your neighborhood. You know, where you live, you just knock on the doors. And then, you know, festivals and places, people aren't in a rush. Um, that's less so running for state representative because literally you have to be done by the end of April. So it's going to be cold in, in February, warmer in March, but maybe rainier and uh, better in April. If you're running for U.S. House of Representatives, you have till you know, into the summer. So, you know, you can go to those kind of events. But always be polite, but don't chat too long, especially with people who oppose you. You know, if someone is clearly not going to sign your nomination papers, say thank you for considering it and move on. Uh, you don't want to get into an argument or certainly not a shouting match with one of your opponent supporters or someone who's just being obstinate and doesn't like you being a pirate. Um, just move on. Be polite. Move on. So asking for signatures, simply tell them who you are, that you're gathering signatures to get a candidate on the ballot, especially if it's you. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm running for this, this office and I'd like it if, and I'd appreciate it if you sign my nomination paper so I can appear on the ballot. Um, Always be polite. If they waver, you know, tell them you want to make sure they have a choice on election day. 60% of all legislative elections never have a challenger, especially in the general election. Um, again, they don't need to vote for you, but helping you get on the ballot is a win for democracy. Um, and then, you know, tell them why you're running. I mean, you know, you would have said, I'm X, I am running as a Pirate Party candidate for state representative, for example, uh, so that already introduces you what and what kind of what you're for. They may say, what's the pirate party? Um, you know, we believe in privacy. We believe you should have privacy and the government shouldn't. We believe you should have power and corporations shouldn't is a nice, efficient way of communicating that. Um, and then, but again, we need more choices in Massachusetts. So you are there putting yourself out. Um, emphasize that. People like choice. Choice is good. Questions? All right, then, moving on. So again, if a voter is, says they've already signed, whether for you or a po opponent, ask them to sign anyway. Doesn't hurt. Um, and they will only get counted once, and you won't be penalized. It's not the SAT. You won't be penalized if they aren't counted for you, right? So if they already signed for your opponent and the paper has been put in, well, then they won't count for you. But if you get the paper in before your opponent, then they will be counted for you. Um, you know, don't be... be kind and polite about it. Obviously, if they're like, no, no, I support this other candidate. Oh, sure. You know, thank you. Thank you for going and, and helping to nominate candidates on the ballot um, and then move on. So when the, you know, the mechanism, you want the signatures to be as legible as possible. So have them sign. I generally have them sign and print their name so that their entry can be read clearly. Um, you know, it's easier for the, easier if the elections clerk can validate the signature and that means it's more likely for the signature to count. Uh, you need their address, but you don't have to fill in ward precinct fields. The clerks will do that. It's not a problem if you do do that, I have found. Um, but you know, that's the clerk's job and, um, so then you keep in mind. And if they aren't voters, but are, are still live in the district, then have voter registration forms. Just stick those on the, you know, stick those below your nomination signatures on your clipboard, um, and then just pull one out. Register them then and there. They register to vote, and then they sign for you. What's not to like? 
So you don't need to fill an entire nomination paper. Um, you should have more than enough nomination papers to gather the signatures you need. Um, so that kind of gets into the if someone, um, you know, someone strikes through your your paper in an attempt to invalidate it uh, or put a stray mark on it or something like that, you know, you can put that below. You don't have to fill, you, you, you know, it would be it would be awful if you filled out 20 names and you wanted just one more to put on it. And then that's the time you get the person who's uh, a rabid supporter of your opponent and they they do something to try and invalidate your nomination paper. Right. Um, so if you do 10 and then you start another paper, you do five, however you you want to do it. Um, and I keep emphasizing this, take care of your nomination papers. Um, never put a stray mark on any nomination paper, no checks, no strike throughs. If someone makes a stray mark, uh, put that paper on the bottom and start with a fresh one. Okay, so you, as I said, you can't, you couldn't go and count out, like go through the voter rolls and be like, okay, this is valid, and I check every single one that's valid. It's like, no, 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 <laughs> you don't want to do that. You, you don't want to do that. If, if you're like, we've gone, there's 10 names on them and nine are valid, take a post-it note. You know, write on the write it on the pad. Nine valid signatures. Stick it on, right? If you need that, then do that, um, and make sure uh, to protect yourself. Um, and I will say this: never leave nomination papers unattended. Uh, I know this happened to one of the state rep candidates years ago. Uh, in my district where for some reason they stuck them in a drawer in their office. They were an incumbent and lo and behold, they disappeared and he had to run in as a write-in. Um, so don't do that. Keep them in a nice safe place, a filing cabinet, wherever you can keep them so that they won't, you know, get lost, have someone put a coffee mug on them, uh, a wet coffee mug on them. You know, you, you want to protect them as, as much as possible. Um, and you don't want to leave them around unattended. Um, and never use a nomination paper that's already been validated by a city or town because they will literally do a strike through the empty signature area. You don't then want to gather another signature on that. So just put it aside in a safe place. Questions? Yes. Um, cool. Going in terms of uh, signatures. Now, I realize that you know, if you were to sign a candidate's paper, a person was to sign a candidate's paper twice, the clerk will only count one of those signatures. Correct. Um, now, I thought it was okay for a voter to sign papers for multiple candidates. Is that not the case? My recollection is that candidates, if, if they're running for the same office, someone can't nominate um, multiple candidates for the same office. So that's my recollection. Um, but if I'm wrong, it doesn't hurt to get the signature and then it gets counted. Um, so that's why I kind of go with, you know, if they're like, oh, I already signed for you or I already I'm signed for your opponent, you know, doesn't hurt to get the signature. If worse comes to worse, it's just invalidated. So, okay, thank you. Would, yep. All right. So candidates first database. Um, it's important to get the voter list from your city or town. This has name, address, date of birth, gender, party, and most importantly, in which elections they voted. Uh, so you can know, is this person who votes in every election? Do they only vote for president? You know, presidential elections, you know, keep that in mind. Um, you can get the assessor's database from your municipality and thus you can identify who's an owner 
and who's a renter, that may be useful. These are all public records. Um, and you can put that into a database and merge the two data sets. And you can add, this person is one of my volunteers, and this person is a donor. Now, this will be incredibly useful for when we do get out the vote efforts uh, and voter identification. But we'll use this later as part of the signature process. So filing nomination papers. Um, you need to file them with your city or town for validation. Uh, and I suggest don't wait to the last minute. Um, I, in, tw in 2002, when I ran, you know, we gathered them all up. And then we had like the last few days of driving, and this is statewide, so driving them to some town to drop off the nomination papers and bring them back. It would have been better to, we would have had a better sense of where we were in our signature gathering effort. Because I know my campaign, I needed 5,000 signatures, but the governor and lieutenant governor needed 10,000 signatures. And we ended up getting way more signatures than we needed. And we should have stopped earlier because that would have helped us with fundraising. <coughs> um, so, you know, if you're, if you're running for a district office, you, you know, like state representative, you can just every, every weekend, every Monday, you go out on the weekend, you gather signatures, Monday, you drop them off, Wednesday, Thursday, they're ready, you come back, okay, what's our count? And you know every week where you are, and you can be like, okay, I've gotten the enough signatures to get, you know, myself and to get uh, enough of a padding that, um, I'll be on the ballot. And then you have that and you can be like, okay, now we can focus on something else, right? We've got our signatures. Um, so again, if you file them early, you get them back before the deadline and you know how many you have and you know when you need to stop. Um, be sure to hand in any voter registration forms on top of the nomination papers so you know their process first. You don't want them going through the nomination papers. This person's not a voter. You know, don't check them. And then they process the nomination papers and it's like, oh, right? Put those on the top. Um, get receipts when you file the nomination papers so you can be sure they're giving them the correct campaign. Um, you have the receipts of the papers you dropped. You can go in, here's my receipt. Yes, you are who you say you are. I shall give you the nominate the validated nomination papers. If you don't get a receipt, um, you can give them a letter on campaign stationery, uh, and that's very loosely defined, authorizing the person bearing the letter to pick up the signatures. So there's there's a fallback if you don't have or you lose or you didn't get uh, receipts. But ideally, get the receipts. Uh, you know, for non-town elections, um, pick them up when you're notified they're available and uh, stop by periodically to check if they are done validating them. But, you know, like you drop them off on Monday and they should be done by Wednesday or Thursday and they'll give you a call. Um, <clears throat> But, you know, don't be like, I dropped them off on, on Monday. Are they done now on Tuesday? <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, you know, they, they got things to do. They'll, they'll get to them. Keep your nomination papers safe. And also, I suggest, but you don't have to do this, copy the nomination papers, um, which we'll use later. So um, before you file uh, with the elections division, you need to make sure your city or town has filled out the voter registration certificate on the required number of forms of nomination papers. Make sure you sign at least one of the nomination papers, or at least one nomination paper saying you accept the nomination. Uh, for state offices, you need to file a statement of financial interests with the Ethics Commission. It's not detailed. It's not like how many down to the last penny do you have? It's like, do you have more than $25,000 in real estate or this type of thing? I mean, it's, it's detailed, but it's not, it's not very onerous. Um, and then for federal offices, you don't have 
any uh, you don't have the ethics commission requirement and for town offices uh, you know as I mentioned in the form you can list anyone who could fill your vacancy if needed so I said keep that data set because um, we can take those signers and put them in your database um, because these are people who you've had the most interaction with uh, who aren't already supporters and volunteers and so it's best not to lose that information because these are people who could potentially vote for you and so it's useful for get out the vote voter identification and get out the vote efforts to have that um, to be able to go back and be like hey I got on the ballot I want to tell you more about me and, and things like that so filing nomination papers um, you know you, you can't file them until you have enough signatures preferably with extra to get on the ballot then you file them with the elections division and and the other required paperwork we mentioned and be sure to publicize when you're dropping them off take photos and videos and, and share widely um, because you know it is a great thing that you are on the ballot democracy is served by having more people on the ballot um, so that you're there is an important accomplishment um, and I would suggest you know you don't need to wait until the nomination paper deadline if you get all your nomination papers signatures and validated by say the middle of March just and you've got your ethics statement and you've got all that other stuff just go and, and hand them in and then you know <clears throat> get that done and out of the way so you can focus on other stuff and then send thank you notes to any volunteers who helped get you on the ballot you know send them a thank you note like if they helped you on Sunday send it send it send them something on Monday um, you know that's it's always nice to do you don't have to wait till the end but if you can only wait to the end because you're busy with other stuff that's okay too uh, but it's important to thank them and tell them that you know you got on the ballot and it wouldn't it wouldn't have happened but for their help because uh, we know it's true I mean I do know of one candidate who managed to gather over 10,000 signatures to get them on the ballot for US uh, Senate I don't recommend that for anybody but he did do it I don't know if he had that much help so we are at 216 um, I have a little bit more about get out the vote and voter ID that I could go over um, do you want to hear that do you have any questions Do you want to take a break? <laughs> yeah, taking five would, would be cool. All right, cool. Um, or, or do you want me to? Do you want to take a break and then I do that slide, or I will fin finish up the presentation first. All right. I mean, yeah, it's it's pretty much done. But I, I had these that I had from a past one, so I just kind of carry them over. All right. Yeah, so next slide. <laughs> Yeah, voter ID is, is yes. Voter ID is is vital for this. Elections are ultimately all about turnout. Um, you know, between five. So this is yeah, I, yeah. These slides weren't really updated. This is kind of aimed towards town elections, but uh, that necessarily yeah. Even for state elections, it's presidential elections tend to have the largest turnout with state with off-year state elections and then it goes down to city and town so turnout tends to be low so um, making sure you get your folks out is vital <clears throat> but you have to identify your supporters so that you can then get them out to vote for you or what's called go TV or get out the vote so you need to meet voters um, you know you can have a supporter who's a parent of a child at a school to introduce you during morning drop-off or afternoon pickup this is more so for K through six, 
less so through uh, middle school um, and certainly not high school. Uh, <clears throat> but, you know, unless you, you want to meet, you know, 17, 18 year olds who will be 18 on election day, that is a youthful thing. Although maybe the thing to do is not do it in the morning uh, when they're going to school, but when they're, when they're leaving. So attend block parties and city or town festivals. Um, and have meet and greet events at senior centers and for members of local groups. Those are all places that you can go out and, and meet voters. Um, you know, you want to keep track of who you meet and their concerns. And I mentioned the database um, that has all the voters in your district. So you can hopefully keep track of it that way. Um, you want to follow up with voters you meet either by dropping off a flyer with a thank you note or by mailing a flyer and thanking them and a thank you. Uh, and you can have supporters write letters to friends telling them why they are voting for you. Um, but it's really vital. Door to door is your best method. Um, it is simply there a way to meet voters Tell them about you and identify which voters will support you. You know, if you not if you see a house that has your opponent's sign on them, maybe they won't. Probably they probably at least one person will not vote for you. But maybe it's their kid who's just turning eighteen who's more interested in pirates than the established parties. Maybe it's a spouse who doesn't doesn't like that particular candidate. Um, you never know. It's always good to, to knock on their door, say, hi, I'm, you know, I'm James, I'm running for state representative, and I'd like to hear your concerns. You know, I saw you have your my opponent's sign on there, um, but, you know, I'm still interested in your concerns. Um, maybe you don't get another voter, but you've also hopefully gotten some goodwill. Um, and from the voter list, you should develop a walk list. You want to divide the addresses into even and odd signs. You don't want to be like, I'm going to start at number one and then cross the street to number two and then cross back to go to three. <laughs> you know, it's like, I want to do all the odd numbers and then cross the street and come back and do all the even numbers. So think about that when you, when you put your voter, when you put your walk list together. Questions? All right, so you want to mark the level of support um, with one, for they will vote for you, and five, they will not vote for you. If a voter, voter isn't supportive, move on quickly but politely. You, uh, your time is valuable and you need to find, find, use it finding someone who is going to vote for you, not arguing with someone who's not going to vote for you. Um, that said, you know, there's still use. There's still there's still uh, benefit from you know meeting them, listening to their concerns. Maybe that'll help in terms of um, <clears throat> help in terms of crafting your platform and the nuances of your platform and things like that. Um, and when someone isn't home, you know, ideally, if you you want to have a flyer with like that little hole and a, and a cut in the paper so you can just hang it on their door handle. You can't put them in their post office boxes um, because that's only for mail, uh, but you could put it in a door slot. Like, I mean, technically that's for mail, but I have people put it in. Um, but certainly hanging on the door handle is, is a good way um, to do that. So all your efforts have to lead to the get out the vote effort. You know, you've identified voters through your door-to-door -door effort. You've met people. Now you want to make sure they're at the polls on election day. Uh, for early voting, before early voting st starts, you want to drop off notices of all supporters telling them where to vote. Uh, you want to call all supporters, remind them that you need their vote, thank them if they voted for you, tell them where to vote and when it is open. Um, that also for mail-in voting, you know, be cognizant. Yeah, this is before before the advent. I need to update these slides. But, uh, you know, if you're mail-in voting, know the dates for when, when early voting starts and when mail-in voting starts and plan accordingly. 
you know, you don't want to go and be still doing your door to door knocking when someone's already voted and they didn't know about you, but they would have voted for you if they did know about you. Um, you want to get that done earlier before you get into early voting or absentee voting. And election day, you know, um, if you can identify who didn't vote during early voting, so, you know, contact your municipality. It, they may have a list of the people who have already voted and you can cross them off your list uh, so you don't need to give them a, a notice. For everyone else who hasn't early voted or absentee voted, um, you know, send them notices uh, telling them where, you know, where and when to vote. Uh, you know, you want to call supporters, remind them that they, you need their vote, tell them where their polling place is and when it is open and when it closes. Ask if you have someone to give rides, ask if they need a ride to the polls. And uh, I guess that's my last slide. The only other things that I would say is support your volunteers like uh, you know election days unless you're a town are in November and it's cold in November so if you can have someone driving around um, giving a uh, hot coffee or hot chocolate or tea or whatever um, and snacks great you're gonna you're gonna win not only brownie points for your supporters and your volunteers but if you if you you can get brownie points for other people who are at the poll uh, as well. I mean, I remember in, what was it? I think it was 98, was that I was standing up for the clean elections law at a polling place in, in Somerville, and the Capuano was running for the first time for U.S. House of Representatives, and, you know, he had someone come by, and they were quite willing to share uh, their hot cocoa and snacks, and you know <clears throat> that wins you points, um, and shows that you know you 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 treat other people well, even if they're not necessarily uh, on your side, and that's that's a good thing. So with that, um, that is my last slide. Um, I will put together the other slide, and we shall record that. Um, but that's it. Any other questions or other thoughts? Let's go to break. Sounds good. All right. So, um, I'll stop sharing my screen and we'll go to break. You want to get back at, uh, two thirty-five? Sounds good. Perfect. All right. Great. See you then. So sorry for folks who are viewing this recording of <laughs> several minutes of dead dead space. <laughs> um, all right. So the next topic is planning for a post twenty twenty four election future. Um, my thought here is to think of what are the scenarios that we <clears throat> um that could happen or are likely to happen? And should we take, what action should we take to prepare ourselves? Um, you know, there's, there's a, you know, th certainly thinking about Trump, him getting back into office, um, you know, some of it will be like the Ars Technica put forth an article that I was amazed actually got on to like major TV news um, where apparently the White House, um, <clears throat> there, there's a medical facility, excuse me, in the White House and they have a pharmacy and they kept giving prescriptions to people with really lax security. Uh, and and they also didn't get the generic version. They the Trump people insisted on the name brand one, which costs considerably more. So you know, obviously that kind of weirdness and and 
corruption will be there, but the calls of Trump as an anti-Democrat um, or Democratic with a small d um, is something to think about, even if maybe some of it is overblown Democratic um, grandstanding. Certainly when it comes to trans people, I, I do not see him um, being in any way favorable to anyone who's trans and it'll likely get a lot worse. So anyways, thoughts? Now, if, um, you know, if the Republican nominee does win, I, you know, hope the, um, I at least hope their administration has the same level of incompetency as the last one, <laughs> which, although it's a strange thing to say it, um, the, I think the lack of competency made things, you know, turn out better than they might have otherwise. Yeah, that really was a shit show, wasn't it? <laughs> that said, I mean, you know, they had the competency to, like, do major tax breaks for, um, you know, made major tax breaks for the, the rich and get their three Supreme Court justices. And so, <clears throat> well, yeah. Actually, I, I think the first question about the post-2024 election is um, – yeah, you know, what does the litigation look like, and how long does it last? I mean, I feel like anything uh, that is, and, and yes, you're you're right, V. We are in a dumb situation now. <laughs> I don't disagree. Um, I mean, I think anything that is federal, he he can have his attorney general squash. We already saw that with some of the stuff that happened. Uh, with the Mueller investigation. And I, I know folks are partisan. He didn't find any, um, you know, they didn't find anything. And yet not all the, not all of it was released. And, um, you know, folks like Marcy Wheeler and others have, you know, bring forth valid and serious concerns about how partisan the, um, the ending of that, um, effort was, <clears throat> but so I think anything at federal, he'll, he doesn't need to pardon himself. He can simply have the justice department, like drop the case mm -hmm. state. However, that's a different story. So V brings up outside of mass, how do we champion, uh, getting, uh, Roe versus Wade back and our full rights from the super security federal state. Um, I would say part of that is still pushing for a right to privacy, um, especially digital privacy, because a lot of the, <clears throat> you know, if, if states that are, um, that have put in place anti-abortion or abortion limitation laws um, can go and get, oh, you drove here and you drove there. Um, if they can subpoena that information or use a warrant to get that information, then um, it becomes, or, or, you know, just go to a data broker, um, then it becomes a lot harder for people to at least get around by going to other states. So I would say that's certainly one part. And that's a right to privacy is something everybody wants, unless you're a wealthy corporation that is banking on our privacy <laughs> or banking our privacy for their profits. So, But V, do you have any other suggestions about how we get Roe versus Wade back? Um, I would say, 
So I think there's certainly a case to be made of creating the drugs potentially ourselves and making them available. Um, I know there's a lot of effort. Uh, <clears throat> there's certainly a community for being able to make various drugs. Um, then you kind of run afoul of the federal government as well, because there are laws about that. Um, but I guess you keep it under the radar so that <clears throat> as much as possible. So V says, re-exposing the statement that the Supreme Court had where they're advocating for adoption. I mean, people have been saying that, and there's still, like, uh, there, are, there are more kids who are, there are more kids who need to be adopted than there are families who want to adopt them. And that's in a case where abortion, where the number of abortions has not really dropped. If anything, it's probably increased once Roe vs. Wade was ended. So I, I feel like that was just one of their BS arguments uh, to begin with. Uh, but, you know, that's what this court does, is they pull stuff out and they make, <laughs> you know, they don't, they don't look at the facts. Um, I, I would, if you can use your mic, it becomes a lot easier than having me paraphrase what you're saying. <laughs> Just saying. Um, yeah, that's, V does note that, um, you know, potentially the people going and just criminalizing speech by talking about abortion. And I think the First Amendment is our defense there. And it isn't, it could certainly be that the Supreme Court um, doesn't support the First Amendment in that case, but all the people yammering on about, oh, there's no free speech anymore, and I can't say, I can't make this joke, or I can't say this thing without pushback. It's like, yeah, well, Put your money where your mouth is. Support people who want to talk about abortion. Um, I, I did have a conflict, um, but that that's why I was typing and, and paraphrasing. But that's, oh, that's the, crazy, the crazy part about our First Amendment is that people want to use it to abuse and oppress people. And that's the only reason why they are championing for a First Amendment. So, like, you know, in the case of, like, transgenderism and... Um, not not even you know like trying to create this huge divide between um the the idea that a trans woman is a woman but oh i have to use my first amendment and say no that's a man's body you know what i mean like mm -hmm. like they this this focus on first amendment has only been used to really oppress people um versus actually declaring anything of me saying hey there's this ancient book, um, and I say, I hope you're listening. There's this ancient book of herb practices in the first in the first peoples of the United States um, that has well documented um, medical practices in there. You know what I mean? Like, just it's it's um, in in the state of Texas, it has become so I can't even look at someone. You know. Um, but yeah, I just want to re reiterate, Texas, I'm here for you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I still think that more speech is the solution. Um, you know, when we look at COSA, you know, where they're trying to well, protect the children by making sure they don't hear about trans experience or the experience of being um, lesbian or gay, bisexual, um, and so forth. It, like they're, they're trying to, to, to harm kids' First Amendment rights, and that's just wrong. 
but you know the the desire to censor is unfortunately uh not limited to any political persuasion <laughs> sadly I wonder too wonder if too. more specifically, you know, pirate wise, if post even now, you know, um it may not be too late now to to talk about election twenty twenty four. If um individual state pirate parties will start saying, Hey, we are going to um think that this, you know, national candidate might represent some of our pirate values, maybe not all of them. We may we may not get to that point in, you know, this election, but maybe towards more coming elections. That could be something. I, I don't know, because I know that you mentioned earlier that, you know, running local candidates as part of your experience. But what do you think about like, um, making a conversation about these national candidates? Do you mean presidential or just any, anyone running for federal office? Um, well, we did start with presidential, but no, any, any office that's, you know, like, um, U.S. seats and stuff like that. Electoral. Yeah, but I think, I think it's up to state parties that if they see candidates that they want to at least tell other people about, like, here are the other, here's, here's about the other candidates who are running for U.S. Senate or U.S. House. And we may not endorse them, um, but you know, here's their positions on pirate issues that we've been able to figure out. I know in the past we've done that, and I think that's a useful tool in in telling people both the issues that are important to us, and you know, this candidate does not support our issues, <laughs> um, and maybe, maybe maybe you're happy about that. Their their desire to have corporations have privacy and us not to. Right. Um, does that answer your question, or is that, does yeah, that? That's, a good, that's oh. a good. Yeah. And, More uh, in, yep. the, in the last uh, state election, I think it was um, the the Texas state legislator had um, propositions, and, and we took a gander and like writing, you know, why we think certain, you know proposition did not respect, you know, private values or the citizens values and stuff like that. Um, as, as a state, so we did that. And we can do that, you know, like, oh, you know, how does so and so these national, you know, cover, you know, and, and, I'm, and I'm using this very loosely, like these people who get reported on in magazines. I know magazines are a, a time of, of the past. Um, but but a huge population of the United States looks to magazines and the print media to still garner their information. Oh, and you know, big news channels. So, so these type of people who get covered widely, you know, if we jump on the train and put our breadcrumb about that candidate, that could pro possibly lead to, you know, a pirate, um, finding out they're a pirate. <laughs> Cause I, I do believe that a lot of people are pirates. They just don't know it. I think you and Joe agree on that. Yeah, I, to further add to it, I have yet to find somebody who disagrees with me politically face to face. Like every single conversation I have, they're like, oh, politics, ah, run away. Or they're like, I completely agree with you, everything you said, and I am from X, Y, and Z party. So everybody's a pirate. If you're American, you're a pirate. I mean, that, that's interesting. Uh, it, it certainly brings up the is issue of, like, in, in 2002 when I ran, you know, the Boston Globe was a big thing, and people got a lot of their news from that. So when the Boston Globe had a picture of me and my, um, and the Democrat and the Republican I was running against, where you know, Stalin-esque, they had um, did, did a story about the two of them and their dispute, showed the picture of the three of us, but had cut me out so all you could see was my hand 
shaking the hand of one of the other candidates. Oh, no. <laughs> I still remember. I still remember that one. Um, and you know, the globe is like a, a, a shadow of what it once was, and so many local news is just being consolidated. Like we had in in Somerville, we had the Somerville Journal. And now that's the, uh, and they had the um, Medford Telegram, and now that's the Telegram and Journal. And it comes out once a week, and it seems to get thinner and thinner. Uh, it's like a horror movie every single <laughs> week. Uh, unfortunately, you know, like they, they, like last week, no, the week before last, they had an article about, um, the lobbying uh, for the Location Shield Act. And, you know, I still have that newspaper, but when I go to the USA Today website for these or, or the local um, Telegram and Journal website, it's not there. The only articles they have are the current articles. It's like it, it's all just disappears. Um, and so we're, we're getting into media deserts. And does that mean that we need to be our own media in that case? I mean, like, if you look at the U.S. history, like, newspapers at, after the revolution were very partisan. Um, and I feel like we're got, kind of going back to that. And, and in a way, and maybe I'm just too nerdy about this media and, and marketing, in a way, you're not wrong. Um, you know, uh, do we need to become our new media? Yeah, some of us can say that Pirates already have their new media um, with the Pirate Party's international Pirate Times. Um, but most specifically, we are our own media, Jamie, with um, the advent of YouTube and these um, social networks that has become the new media. Um, sadly, the world still operates in a physical fashion, right? And I can tell you that 90% of the Northeast will not have internet on a good day. Um, and that would be the less areas that are populated. So like if you look at Texas, for example, we have major spots of population, and then we have spots where there is no population and there is no internet. Um, and so then that, you know, older media becomes more relevant. So yes, you know, this, this, this new, this journal that comes out only once a week, as sparse as it can be, um, we used to believe that the internet was forever. I read an article that the internet is not forever anymore. Um, servers I, I know earlier in the, in the in this conference uh, the, uh, somebody mentioned that you have to sign in for everything and everything is tracked and that's correct it's true but it's not tracked forever like you know server capacity and server space is being deleted um as you said yourself just right now you go to these local newspapers you go to their website and the only thing available is the um the stuff that's current because they don't have the space for it. So where does that leave us, the pirates? Um, in the breadcrumb of the machine of the world and in the breadcrumb of the machine, of the machine in the real world, um, one of the things that you said that was really um, instrumental and that I always um, advocated for as, um, as previous swarm care manager is that we're real people and you know we need to like in the way that we interact with each other and know each other's stories and and value each other and affirm that we are you know like you thank your volunteers if you know if you're um if the democrats a volunteer was cold you would give them a hot cocoa because you have hot cocoa you know that, that like like we are kind of in this together believe it or not um sometimes we just like to fight with each other I don't know where else I was going with that. Please chime in. Well, if I can chime in, uh, one of the particular policies that we created within the last year or so um, was that the internet as a human right. And we actually really do have an actionable way to really push that with MeshNet. So if we were to incorporate that into 
really pushing MeshNet and making MeshNet a municipality thing or even a state thing where uh, here in Massachusetts, that's one going to be one of the big things I'm pushing for is to make sure that everybody has access to the internet and thus uh, the greater human knowledge um, and making that a very sustainable thing as part of a part of our policy set making process because um, it really is such a powerful equalizer because it allows people to get informed about things beyond what those individual narrow newspapers like the Boston Globe and stuff like that and really start to learn about all the candidates. So if, if we really want to put effective change into what in bettering people's lives and helping them make informed decisions, then that's, that really is at the core of who we are. We're very technologically based. We're very fact based. So going out there to open up the whole to allow things to continue to move forward and progress um, and progress for the better. I think that's a real, it's going to be a real key thing for us moving forward. My concern about relying too much on social media is you're at the mercy of a corporation's profits and how they want to prioritize the different posts that people make. Um, you know, my experience with Twitter, for example, is that there's fewer and fewer kind of real interactions. Um, and the stuff that tends to get attention um, isn't necessarily as thought out. Um, it's ref it's um, not reflect it's it's not it's reflexive, not uh, ref <clears throat> I'm gonna make that. it's not not ref not re it's reflexive, not reflective. Um, and you know that could likely be mo I mean, that could likely be just most everything, but it seems it seems worse now, um, you know. And so if you and I think it feeds on itself if you post less because you're getting less attention, then you get even less attention. And so kind of being able to step aside and try something else. Um, is probably a better approach. I'm, what that is, I'm not sure. Um, I, I do like the idea of physical meetings and literally just putting up posters around and telling people about it that way. I feel like that might actually get you more attention than posting. I'm going to have this event on you know on Twitter or Facebook or wherever. And that's why we need both. The best part of the work that I do outside of pirate work is I play a lot with the algorithms on social medias. Um, they're mostly like what we started to call, you remember in the days when Reddit was important, we had novelty accounts. Um, and so like, so basically I have these novelty accounts and, and uh, play around with the algorithm, figuring out the same way that search engine optimization figures out every algorithm Google tries to put um, and now it's now it's there is no figuring out because everything is like about money um, and such on Google when you search on Google um, because it's connected to our phones and all of this stuff so um, what I'm saying is why not both y por qué no los dos? I guess my thought is we're volunteers. There's only so many hours in the day and going and putting a lot of putting effort into social media that is going to have little payoff. Um, either you have to be more efficient about it or, or you know, find like, like we just do screen captures of our images or everything is like, I'm going to read this to you. And, and rant on TikTok 
and communicate that information that way rather than here's a link to what we said or something like that. I, maybe that's the, the solution is just change the form. But I think there's I think there's usefulness in having physical events and bringing people together to talk. And I think to some degree that's something that we could do differently. You know, it's like people watch Fox News and they don't necessarily connect with one another. Their relationship is between them and Fox News or them and MSNBC. Um, and I think if you can get people together to talk to one another, um, that might be more productive. We need a space big enough for a round table so that we can all have an equal share in the discussion. I'm fine with a square table, but sure, that'd be nice. Are there any bars with square with round tables? I mean, actually, the only places I can think of are restaurants that have round tables. It's the principle of the round table, Jamie. You missed it. I'm just kidding. Yeah, don't be a square. <laughs> Sorry, uh, everybody. This is not everybody against Jamie show. <laughs> I can take it. I can take it. <laughs> I can take it. Interestingly enough, yes, we are nothing. We are volunteers. Um, the the pirates. I don't even think um uh, international pirates have like paid what paid volunteers. Um, the 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 funny part about the swarm theory is that yes, we are volunteers, but everybody has their specialties, right? Question mark? <laughs> no, absolutely. And they certainly have their own circles that they run in. I mean, to, yeah, as swarm wise is you should talk with the people you know, not try and talk with people who you don't have an affinity with. And so if everyone kind of does that within the swarm does that, then that'll have bigger effects than a top down approach. I mean, we should start a swarm wise reading group. I keep saying that, and I have a feeling we should probably actually do it this year. <clears throat> you know, why don't we plan on having the next conference, uh, in-person conference, even if it's a small gathering, we can definitely do a library of some sort, probably closer to Boston, and still have an online portion to it so people can dial in. But um, having a, a conference, at least like halfway through the election cycle, uh, might really benefit us and give us something to... Um, some place like for a meet and greet of candidates and stuff like that. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. I think every six months is the sweet spot. I, I think if I think four times four times a year is is too diffuse and one time a year is not enough. So like a winter and and summer is kind of a nice way of doing it. Especially if we can have people talk about different topics as well. Yeah, I do like the, the quarterly, um, like, big sit-down get-togethers. However, I'm, I was talking about twice a year we all meet up for, like, cocoa and muffins. Yeah, I mean, I think, <clears throat> like, one of the things I wanted – want to do this year is to get the Somerville Pirates to be meeting regularly. So I think in some ways, like Somerville, Cambridge, Arlington, Medford, something like that, um, of having those be monthly or something, some, some periodic, reliably periodic uh, and sufficiently frequent uh, personal get-togethers, I think would be good. Um, but you know, if there's always if there's more interest, we can always have more conferences. But it's you know, I'm looking at the last few, and I feel like fewer, more focused, um, maybe better, better advertised. <laughs> well, 
What does Texas do there? <clears throat> v. So glad you asked. Uh, Texas, um, in our in our history, uh, under my leadership. Ah, just kidding. Um, we do steering committee meetings, roughly at least twice a month. But um, we have we're spread apart in two parts of Texas, and um, the hour between us is 12, 13 hours between us. So. Um, the northern part of Texas, they try to do meetups and just do meet and greets. And then us in the lower part of Texas, we just kind of like do updates with each other. We'll, we'll meet in person, grab some tea, ice cream, hopefully next time. Um, but that's what we've been doing. And in terms of like work, um, I, I feel strongly that the that national pirate the national pirates should um, promote us more as states, um, and in the same way that we promote the state, the national in our states, um, in the fact that the state parties are the volunteers for the national party. There, I don't think there's any independent national volunteers right now. I mean, certainly I would say, uh, like, if you tag Massachusetts on the social media that we're on so we can see it, then we can go and promote it as well. And I think, I mean, you know, if you've got 10 or 15, it becomes a little bit of an issue. But, you know, we can, certainly, we can at least do some of that, some of some promotion of one another. Yeah, and then um, one of the things that that um, Delaware, no, Delaware, not Delaware, the other D, D.C., Maryland, Virginia, the DMV Pirates, they, um, one of the earlier things that they did is when they host their meetups, they go through um, meetup.com, which then feeds into Eventbrite, so that's two, that's two social networks that connects their meetups and then that's how they then then from then it goes into social networking in terms of like promoting their in person meetups. Um, and they just do meetups right now. Delaware doesn't do anything. I'm not sure about California and Illinois right now. How they, they do they do conferences or meetups or something like that. So is meetup.com and Eventbrite are connected or do they just post in both of them? They're, they're two different things, but meetup feeds into Eventbrite somehow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, in terms of technology. Uh, in, in terms of events, I think like here we've got the Boston channel, we've got the local um, kind of classified event listings at some local newspapers and of course craigslist which is national um, are good places to post that beyond you know facebook which exists in its own walled garden <clears throat> so um one of the speculations um, for a Trump presidency is um, declaring martial law or some d doing on steroids what he did towards the end of the in in the summer and fall of uh, 2020, which was send various uh, federal law enforcement agencies into the cities of various places to stir up trouble. Uh, so obviously we talk about protecting your privacy online uh, and we can continue doing that, but are there other things we should do should that happen? I mean, I've read here's the, the thing. report. Sorry, which report? 
there is a report that Indiana, and I've totally forgot about Indiana. There's a report that the Indiana rep, uh, a rep to the U.S. Pirate Party, sent to me, um, and it's literally what the Republicans or the far conservatives would do once they get elected power, and it like details list by list of what they want to do, um, and that's what we should prepare for. And I can't what? remember the name, but I'm looking for the document right now. Okay. <clears throat> hey, v, I have a question for you, too. Um, so what's going on with Texas and talking about seceding? Uh, yes. So um, what's happening with Texas, the Texas legislature? Okay, look, I can't look for the document and answer the question. So I'm going to answer the question yeah. first. This is what's happening in our Texas borders. People are migrating because they want a better future and they can't even steal a mattress from a dumpster to sleep on. They're migrating into the USA at um, speeds that the United States cannot allow because they don't want to. Um, so Texas, the governor of Texas put these barbed wires and extra, you know, um, protection against these people who are migrating into the United States through without going through like due process and um, the legalization. So the Supreme Court voted, hey, that's inhumane. Do not put barbed wires and, you know, stuff like that. And so Texas said, hey, thanks for voting against us. You're wrong. And um, you will see about that. So that's the whole issue with um Texas just being dumb. The Texas legislator and the Texas law and the constitution is written so badly and any way that a person in power in Texas can do anything, the legislative is by amending the constitution. So uh, that's the gist of it. More questions? <laughs> yeah, I and mean, last I knew the 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 federal's response federal the federal government is responsible for the borders not state governments so yes but it is uh, it goes through the state the money goes from federal to state that's why you have the um border patrol yeah but that's a federal customs and border patrol is a federal agency it's not state yeah, but the state has to say, oh, yes, you can come on our state to use your federal powers. Remember, it's, it just always comes down I to... Don't, I don't think that's the case. I think the federal federal government has powers regardless of what the state thinks, right? It's I true. mean... It's true. <laughs> You're not wrong. But does Texas believe the same you do? No. Hmm. Yeah, so if you can find that report, that would be great. So, yeah, you're like, ah, report. So, um, was it shared on Discord? No, okay. I went independently and looked it up. It's, um, it's either the Heritage Foundation or something of that. It has the word American and Heritage in it, but it is a document. And I downloaded it in the winter. Okay, this is getting closer. This is how my brain works. When did I download it? And then what folder did I put it into? And you would think that everything will get to the folder that says pirates, but it doesn't. Uh, just give me a couple of minutes. Do, 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 do. I found this article from the AP. Conservative groups draw up plan to dismantle the U.S. government and replace it with Trump's vision. Yeah, it's called something like that. So, I mean, even if he does try to declare martial law, like, every state's going to be just like, nah, dude. Yeah, but, I mean, we fought a civil war that resolved to some degree that... <laughs> Who has preeminence there? But yeah, <clears throat> that's the problem. Yeah, let's see a link to the actual proposal. Here it is the Heritage Foundation Project 2025. Oh, Heritage. Oh, isn't that the Heritage Foundation? 
Station? Yeah. I sent you the link and I don't know where I downloaded the document from, but it has the first three here. Um, key takeaways, it's past time to lay the groundwork for a White House more friendly to the right. The policy book mandate for leadership represents the work of more than 350 leading conservatives and outlines a vision of conservative success. The usual suspects in permanent political class will be ready for the next conservative administration. Will we be ready for them? And that's just from the heritage.org on project right. 2025. The whole document, I don't know where it is, but I know I downloaded it. Just, I, it's like 400 pages long. Yeah, I mean, Heritage has been around for a long time. Yeah, it kind of gets into the, um, when chaos comes, be sure you're ready, because <laughs> you're going to need to push your agenda in place. Sorry, go on. No, no, I, I, I just, you know, now I'm like looking for for it by name. So it's called the Mandate for Leadership. Are the Proud Boys still a thing? I mean, I haven't been really following the group very closely. I but, think they changed their name uh, again. They, they, did they, their, like, leader get arrested? Yeah, he was convicted, I thought. And, like, serving forever for, like, mutiny. Certainly sometime. Anyways, what it means for people of color and for LGBT people, and um, as far as some people are, are theorizing that what this means um, conceptually is for even things like um, same sex or same gender marriage could be reversed is what some people are preparing for from, you know, that I've seen. I just can't find the document right now because I didn't put it in the folder where it belongs. Is it mandate for the mandate for leadership, the conservative promise? Yes. Okay. Did you find it as well? I did. Yeah. Poking around the heritage. Oh, here so. it is. Project 25 presidential transition project. Oh no, it's the website. Yeah. Yes. Hosted by Centralizing the personnel agencies, managing the bureaucracy. Okay, yeah, you found it. Yeah. Do you have a link, Jamie? Yeah. I will put it in the chat. And all its PDF glory. Yeah, I think that, I don't know, underpinning some of these things is, is still the fight, fight to make sure we all have privacy and we're not spied on. Because with both, if you don't have privacy and they can, they can spy on you, then it doesn't matter if it's, you know, Biden or Trump, we're still going to be worse off. Just how much worse off, <laughs> I guess. John, do you have any thoughts? Only to point out that in you know 2018, the uh, uh, Congress made a bipartisan effort to send the FISA uh, section of was it section 702 uh, a renewal to uh, uh, to the White House for signature. So, yeah, the the push for privacy should should be important regardless who's in charge. Thanks, John.
from talking with people, do you feel like people understand more about their need for privacy and things they can do to protect them? You know, use Signal, use not Chrome, um, use an ad blocker, things like that? Or is, is it just the same as it's been four years ago? I mean, pretty sure privacy has been pretty terrible for a long time. I mean, one of the big things about privacy is that they could just go to literally any wireless carrier and get all of your information at any point. Uh, most of the time, the, the carrier is just giving them all the information even without a warrant. I mean, they, they sell it. They, they, they like... There, there's like a website at and I think it was at and had that you could go and be like, I want it on this phone number. Give me all the information you have. <laughs> and by the way, that's cost you nine ninety nine. <laughs> Even when you pay, you're still you're still <clears throat> you're still the product. Well, and uh, I think we can. We're going to add automobile manufacturers to that list too. <laughs> oh my God! Yeah, yeah. And does Tesla have a good privacy policy? None of none of them do. I mean, all, yeah. the OnStar privacy policy is horrific. Yeah. So. Doing my best to keep my 2010 or 20, 20 something tens car still running. <laughs> Without all of that. So I came, well, in my adulthood, I started coming out to the political scene um, with the Occupy ideals of making, you know, taking money out of, out of politician, you know, corporations um, and that kind of aspect. So like, I think for the future of of um, of our push is our push to our appeal is one make corporations and gover the governments accountable and transparent. You know, open and transparency, but you know, keeping people like private. Um, and there is a article out there that even with three data points of any activity you do online, you can be traced. Like you only need three data points. Like it's that's how far and wide and how tracked we have been that now in the year 2024 with three data points, people, you know, these advertisers will know who you are, what you want to buy and where you spend your money and stuff like that. Nobody is saying, hey, advertisers, <laughs> stop telling me that I want to buy blue shoes when I've been looking at uh, shoes all day long. I mean, I think ad blockers is to some degree the solution there. One of the things I've noticed is that after buying something from certain manufacturers, I'll start seeing ads for their product. Which seems backwards, but <laughs> it is creepy. Well, the, whole, the, worst, the worst for me is when I try to, I put in my email address and I don't hit submit and that company sends me an email. Ah, uh, that's, that's, that's low. That, that is, that is creepy. Yeah. Like, hey, I saw that you were trying to check out and buy this grill. Why didn't you finish buying your grill? Still want to buy that grill, but I didn't need them to stalk me like that. Would it have been easier if they gave you fifteen percent off? No. Okay. Good. I, I'm not a. I'm not a buyer. I'm a. You know, I'm a hardwired person to not look at advertisements and not get swayed. <laughs> um, I was gonna pay full price for that grill. Actually, I was gonna buy four of them. And then instead of hitting checkout, I had already put in my email address, but I hadn't hit submit or anything like that. Yeah, 
it happens. No, no, did they just send me a text? I'm gonna check. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> No, <laughs> that would have really gotten me. Oh man! Yeah, it's sort of funny. Um, you know, when I started working in tech twenty years ago, Microsoft was kind of like the uh, seen as the you know, like the big evil corporation, and now they're they're kind of the with by context, they're kind of the friendly ones at this point. <laughs> I, I can't, I, you know, having having remembered the whole Windows suits and stuff, I can never see them as friendly. <laughs> but, but yeah, I get your point. And compared to Amazon and and Google, like oh my god, like even if With the it, amount of telemetry that Windows has these days, it's hard to argue that they're friendly at all. Uh, that's true. Even if Bill Gates donated all his money, including the scam that is the William Gates Melinda Foundation. Um, they still wouldn't be the kindest. I don't know. Um, have you seen every time you're, com I have Windows 11, every time it updates and I'm just like, hmm, really? You're doing what to me now? Uh-huh. I don't know, maybe we should like get a copy of Minix and like put it out there with no spyware. <laughs> I'll run them off Raspberry Pis. <laughs> Which I guess are getting fast enough. Like I don't know. I think the the Raspberry Pi Five may um, actually be a suitable desktop computer. <clears throat> you know what's ridiculous though is that outside of like I don't know professions where you use your computer, we don't need computers anymore. I I think most people do everything on their phone. Uh, phones have that type of processing power. I can't, mm -hmm. for example, write you a program on my phone and, you know, develop it with like um, uh, a SDK or anything like that. Um, but I could type it up in like notes or whatever and then, exp and then go on my computer and, and finish it up and run it and debug it and stuff like that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, it's gotten to that point. I, I, I've been doing a lot of the pirate graphics from my phone phone on canva.com oh, oh this is not an ad for canva.com use other please <laughs> but you know what i mean like crazy yeah but i feel like that's gathering number that's gathering data on you probably everything gathers data Pluralistic.net, I think, doesn't gather any data on you. <laughs> well, there, well, we finally <laughs> found, uh, the other day, we were trying to, um, uh, in, in the inter international pirate scene, we were trying to, like, make a link. And so, like, if you go to a link, you can tell your browser, and I hadn't know this, known this, but you can, in the header of your website, you can tell the browser not to cache your website. Um. Which, of course, for people, you know, they say, but if you don't cache it, how are you going to save it? But if you don't cache it and you don't track cookies or anything like that, um, you can be done. You just have to, like, put don't don't save on your on your website in the header. And I'm just like, wow. You know, like it can be done. No tracking mm -hmm. can be done. Do people want to do it, though? No, because we're in a uh, capitalistic society. There's this cool book I'm reading. I want to let me see. Find the Wikipedia link. Yeah, I, I'm personally a big fan of um, you know setting the browser up to clear everything out <laughs> when I shut it down. <laughs> Cookies, history, cache, et cetera, et cetera. I think it depends on whether I need to log in. <laughs> if I'm in a, in a site, I'm like, I don't want to have to log in every single time that I use it daily. 
but yes, that, that is, that, that, I mean, it all certainly saves you space, right? Mm -hmm. Like if your hard disk is a little um, constrained, you know, not having, uh, uh, you know, a hundred Chrome tabs open, <laughs> well, you know, and, and just like I shut it down and it all just goes away. Um, Firefox profiles are a good solution for that. Every every site has its own has its own uh, uh, profile with its own cookies and everything. It doesn't cross contaminate. Oh, so you could then be like, this site I don't want to delete everything, but this other but some other random site I went to I don't care. And well, I've got so, like a, a yeah. Facebook container, basically. So you know, all my Facebook related activities happen in that container. They don't happen in the container I use for anything else. So, you know, any tracking cookies or anything like that that they put in doesn't doesn't cross contaminate to the rest of your browsing. You want to do a demo of that at some point? <laughs> I think more people need to know that. I can do that. Thanks. Um, yeah, it would probably be good to um, go to a variety of data brokers and try to find the information that's on us and tell people how to do that. I know, Steve, you did something back in 2013. And unfortunately, when I went to that particular site, they're like, no, we don't do this anymore. So maybe they have another mechanism, but it wasn't quite so easy. So are there other topics to discuss or um, or any any additional things to say or should we call it a day? Uh, I am as much as I love spending time with you guys, I am all for calling it a day. Well, I'm I'm in favor of that. What about everybody else? Okay, here. And Jamie, if you refresh the page, uh, you'll see that I've um, you'll see the notes I've been taking. Oh, I appreciate that very very much. John V. Stay on, or should we stay? Or should we go now? Down. Let's go enjoy I'm, our Saturdays. There's still I'm, day I'm, left. I'm, Let's go. Yeah, I'm good. I got laundry to fold. <laughs> well, well, believe it or not, today the sun will go down at 5 p.m. in Massachusetts. <laughs> All right, guys, you got one hour left of sun. Let's go. My All right. son. Other type of sun just discovered the crier bell that we have, and I'm trying to save you all from it. <laughs> we appreciate that. Um, so, with that, um, I, I thank all of you for coming to this. Um, the ballot ballot should be out by tomorrow. Thank you, Steve, for getting the IDs ready or the pins ready. And um, we're this. I will go and upload this and uh, include it in our conference page and at masspirates.org. And um, yeah, I think we've got uh, Joe. Can you make pirate news tomorrow? I should be able to. All right, then I will go and schedule that as well. And I've already talked with Steve about that. I know he can make it. So great.
All right, folks, I hope you have a wonderful day. We've got a meeting on Thursday to uh, to replace Joe, who is irreplaceable, with a new, um, uh, at least temporary candidate. So, uh, yeah, or quartermaster. Um, oh, you built me up. <laughs> All right, well, I hope you all have a good time. I'm going to stop the recording now. Thank you.